Now we revisit the Laplace transform for second order equations. Remind you of the overview. We start with a differential equation and we want to find its solution. We do that by applying the Laplace transform and replacing all the functions of time by functions of the variable s. And then in that space, it's very easy to do a little algebra to solve for capital X, the transform of the solution we want. And the last step, which is usually the hard one, is to take the inverse transform to get the solution in time. Here's a table of transforms that we've added to. Here I'm highlighting the new lines. I'm not going to go through how those are derived. It's pretty straightforward. Instead, instead I'm just going to go through how we use these. So here's our linear constant coefficient equation. When I take the transform of everything, for the second derivative we get s squared times capital X minus s times the initial condition of x minus the initial x prime. And then we take the transform of x prime, which we've done before. So this all can be solved for capital X. I'm going to write it as two separate terms over the same denominator. First thing to notice is that the denominator is really the characteristic polynomial of the ODE. Just replace lambda with s. The whole first term is what we would call the free response. It's what the system does in the absence of any external inputs. And the second term then is the forced response. The zeros that appear in the denominator of the transform are called poles. Each real pole, when we inverse transform, gives us an exponential solution in time. And each pair of conjugate poles give us, after the inverse transform, a sine and or a cosine in time. And because that characteristic polynomial is in the denominator, its roots are the eigenvalues of the ODE, and so those eigenvalues are themselves poles. But then the forcing function usually brings its own poles. Here's our first example. We take the Laplace transform of everything. It's not necessary to memorize the formula for capital X. It's easier just to take the transforms and solve for it each time. So here we get capital X. I'll write it again as two terms. 
first term has two poles from the characteristic equation, and the second one also includes an extra pole at 3. That means the partial fraction decomposition has three terms in it, one for each pole. Our next goal is to find what A, B, and C must be. I'll do that by clearing the denominators multiply through by the product of all three pole terms. When I do that on the left, I get 4s plus 12 times s minus 3, plus 24 by itself. And then on the right, each of these has two out of the three pole terms. It's just missing the one that's in its denominator. This has to be an identity for all values of s. I could write each side as a polynomial and match coefficients, but there's a much easier path. We can actually substitute particular values of s, and the ones to choose are the poles. So if I take the pole at 3, for example, then the left side is just 24. On the right side, I get 2 times 4 times a, and then the b and c terms drop out. So right away we know that a equals 3. Next I'll put in s equals 1. The left side works out to be negative 8. And now on the right, only the b term survives. So we can find out what b is. And then finally, I put in s equals negative 1. The left side works out to be negative 8 again, and on the right, only the c term survives. So we found c. So now we can rewrite the partial fraction decomposition with all the values known. And this is easy to invert. Now let's consider what happens when we have imaginary poles. So plus or minus i omega. Together, these poles give us a quadratic term in the partial fraction decomposition. Once we find the a and the b, we're set, because the inverse transform is easy. The first term, s over s squared plus omega squared, gives us a cosine. And the second term, multiply and divide by omega, and we get the sine of omega t. Here's an example of an undamped oscillator. Take the transform of both sides using the initial values. We saw for capital X. Once again, I'll write the contributions from the initial values separately. Both terms have the imaginary poles of plus or minus 3i. 
first term is ready to invert as is. Second term is like something we had the first time around in Laplace stuff. It's an exponential on s times an f of s. And we have the shift theorem telling us that the result is a step function times the shifted version of f. So here capital F is just 1 over s squared plus 9, and that's invertible to give us a sine function. Putting everything together, x of t has two contributions, the first term that we inverted directly, and the second term that resulted from the shift theorem. Here's another example with imaginary poles, this time from the forcing function. I'm assuming zero initial conditions, so capital X will just have this one thing. It's got imaginary poles from the cosine, as well as the characteristic polynomial, which here has two real poles. So its partial fraction decomposition will have three terms. One of them is the quadratic from the imaginary poles, and then one for each of the real poles. So our job is to find the four constants in this formula. And once again, I'll do it by clearing the denominators. Okay, if I put the real poles in one at a time, first, if I choose s equals 1, then the only term on the right that survives is the d. Second pole is s equals 3. And that isolates the C on the right. Now I have the two imaginary poles, plus or minus I. Turns out I only need to use one of them. So I'll put in S equals I. Now just the A and B together survive. If I multiply the second and third of these numbers together, the real part is 3 plus I squared, that's 3 minus 1. And then I have negative 3I and negative I. And if I multiply these together, I have two real terms. And two imaginary terms. 
So this all has to equal 10i. But remember, complex numbers really have two real pieces of information. So I can equate the real and imaginary parts of this. So that tells us that the real part of 4a plus 2b is equal to the real part of 0 on the left, and 2a minus 4b is equal to the imaginary part, which is 10. So this is two equations with two unknowns, which you know how to solve. Now we know all the details of our partial fraction decomposition. And each of these can be inverted. First one gives us a combination of cosine t and sine t. and each of the others gives an exponential contribution. Complex poles with a non-zero real part introduce one more step. So let's say the real part is a. We're going to use this entry from the table that says that an exponential in time times f is a shift of the transform. This is actually the dual of the shift theorem that we learned before. So that tells us we should define a capital X with a complex pole pair as a shifted version of capital F where a is the shift, then that tells us how to find capital F of s, once, because we already know capital X. That lets us find little f, and then that lets us find little x. That's our plan. Here's a damped oscillator with zero initial conditions. The transform has just the characteristic polynomial in the denominator. So its roots are the poles of capital X we can find by the quadratic formula. We get negative 1 plus or minus 3i. So that negative 1 is our real shift. We're going to define capital X of S as equal to f shifted by a, so s plus 1. And that's because little x of t will then just be an exponential times little f. So now we have to find little f of t. Well, that was our definition of capital F in the first place. So we can find what capital F of S is. Everywhere we had an S before in capital X, we replace it with S minus 1. If we've done things correctly, now we should have only imaginary poles.
this is almost something we know how to invert, except it's got an extra exponential factor in it. So we're going to have to apply the old shift theorem again. And capital V is something with imaginary poles that we can invert immediately. So to wrap things up, x of t is an exponential times f of t, and f of t is a delayed version of v of t. Which we know. Repeated poles are another complication. So first we'll use the fact from the table that the transform of t to the n is n factorial over s to the n plus 1 power. That's if n is a positive integer. So that's a multiple pole at s equals 0. Here's an example of a double pole at negative 3. Well, I want to shift that so that it's at zero. So capital F has a double pole at zero. Compare that to our new transform formula. And we see we should take n equals 1. 1 factorial is just 1, so the inverse transform of this capital F is just 6t. And since capital X was a shift of capital F, X of t is an exponential of negative 3t times F. Here's one last new formula from the Laplace transform, the transform of t to the n times any function f of t is negative 1 to the n times the nth derivative of capital F. Here's how we use that. This is an undamped oscillator being driven at resonance. So the denominator has one factor of s squared plus 4 from the sine 2t and another one from the characteristic polynomial. So we have double poles at plus or minus 2i. Now this capital S almost looks like the derivative of something we know how to deal with. It's just missing that factor of s in the numerator and a negative sign, which is trivial. So I'll define a new thing that has the s in it. If capital Y is s times capital X, then capital Y is the derivative of something we know how to deal with. And that thing is what I wrote in brackets, 1 over s squared plus 4. So that's easy to invert, just gives us a sine 2t.
and then capital Y was minus F prime. So by this latest line of the transform table, we know that little y is t to the 1 times little f of t. But we also define capital Y as s times capital X, which means y is equal to x prime. Remember, the initial conditions are 0. So we know how to find x prime from all this. So x itself is just one integration away. It's the integral of y, which is t times f of t. That just requires a standard integration by parts. And we can use the initial value to work out that the integration constant here is 0.